to see everybody who's made it back with us this evening, or, and we're so glad to, to be with everybody this morning and this evening as well. It's been a, a beautiful, beautiful day, although the weather seems to be a little changing. Uh, still yet, as you uh, may or may not know, if you don't like the weather, it'll be better sometime in the week. I uh, just got to keep out, keep your lookout for it. That's how weather generally does here in, in East Tennessee. And, and you know, we like to think our, our weather is different from everybody else's weather, but you know, everybody I've talked to, no matter where they're from, they say the exact same thing. If you don't like it in a few days, it'll be better. And that gives us hope. And what I mean by that is the things that we go through in life don't always stay with us. If we don't like them, it'll get better. And if we like them, hold on. We're going to go through a rough patch, but don't worry. It'll get better. It'll get better. When we pick up tonight our study, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 9, uh, what we're going to look again is uh, the Beatitudes. And these are attitudes that as we apply these things to our life, there's a building process. Uh, it starts out with the poor in spirit or those who know without God they're, they're morally and utterly bankrupt. But spiritually speaking, with Christ we have all things. Uh, blessed are those who mourn and some things that would cause mourning. If you look around the world, there's a lot of sadness. That could cause mourning. There's a lot of people who need help. That could cause mourning. But when we consider the sin-sick world that we live in, that should cause us to mourn a little bit. It should make us very sad. But yet, when one day this, this will be done and be over, and we'll be comforted from those from that, that outlook. Uh, blessed are the meek, the meek, the, the, those who humble themselves to desire to want to do what God says, to follow His will. From there, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And the thing is, you can do as much righteousness as you want. You can do the right thing to people all you want. Uh, a lot of times we, we think about Christianity or, or being told about Christianity, is about all these things you can't do. But there's so many things we can do. We can be loving and peaceful and joyful and long-suffering with people. We, we can do that all we want and desire. And as those that, that need help, we, can, we have the ability to help them. So you'll never run out of, of great things to do. Uh, being merciful. When we start thinking about our own sin and the Savior we have, and we have the ability to look at other people and say they also need a Savior. And so we don't have to hold grudges. We can be merciful because they are like we are. Make mistakes. We're sinners. The pure in heart are those who desire not to be tainted by the things of this world. And then we come to verse 9. It reads, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. If I ask you a question, I, I want you to think just for a second. What does it mean to have peace? What does that mean to you? See, when we think about peace, sometimes we like to paint it up like a picture. Now, I, I like to be outside, so when I paint pictures in my mind, I paint it outside. Generally, it's on a, the shore of a lake, and the sun is just coming up, and all the beautiful colors are there, and the, there's a slight breeze with a little ripple on top of the water, and all the cares of the world are just gone. And if you've ever been there, you know the cares are just gone. But there's other ways you can paint that. To you, what does it look like in your life? The idea of a calm, still sensation in your soul. So that's amazing. Now, a lot of times we have to look at the opposite. We look at the opposite to really get the full effect. Uh, just imagine being at war or a continuous argument. Now, we, some of us, that's what our life almost looks like. And so the opposite of that would be if all that just stopped. That would be the opposite. See, the idea of being a peacemaker, that, that, is, that is a humongous thought, and yet when we think about being a peacemaker, we're, we're never more like God than whenever we're being peacemakers. Have you ever sat and thought about it? When you, we can look at sin, and we'll go there in just a minute, but we think about sin, it's a rebellion against what God wants. And as we rebel against God wants, sometimes, a lot of times, we hurt the feelings of those we love the most. Those who in about, what, two weeks will be sitting out with Thanksgiving meal saying, well, I'm glad you're still here. And, you know, and we sit, and, we're, and the thing is, with that is a separation or turmoil. And so, what? but when we're like God, we make all that go away. See, G God, through Jesus, made a, a way to make peace. We don't have to fight with God anymore. Sin's a rebellion. But through Jesus, there's peace. There's reconciliation or coming together. 
And so as we act and behave like, like a peacemaker, we're acting the way God would act in those type of situations. When things seem to be out of hand, they come back into control. And when life seems to be very hard and very troublesome, it comes back to a manageable part. And so this afternoon, I want to focus a little bit on what that looks like. See, the first thing I want to look at is God as a peacemaker. How, and what does that look like when we read Scripture? Sometimes we don't, you know, we don't think about God as this way, God trying to make peace. And you say, well, why is that? And the best answer I can give for just that question, why do we not see God as a peacemaker, is when things don't go our way, when trouble sometimes comes. And we are vexed to our very souls. Who do we say did that? We say, God, why would you put me in this place? And yet we made a dozen decisions that got us there. See, when we blame God for the situation the world's in, not only does it not get a whole lot better because we've got to fix ourselves to fix all of these situations, we don't see him on the other side as wanting to bring peace and love. So we turn our Bibles over Romans chapter 3. Now, as we... Uh, as I pointed to this morning a little bit, Romans 1 describes the, the depravity of the, Jew, uh, of the Gentiles. When I say depravity, I mean the, the sinful state, the, how far sin has taken them away from where God is and who God wants them to be. And there's a long, lonely road at the end of that. And then you go to Romans chapter 2, and, and you, know, you look at the first chapter, Gentiles, oh, they're, they're not living God's way, so you might say, well, Jews are doing all right. You know, they're looking pretty good. And yet, when you go to Romans in chapter 2, they also have failed. They didn't live up to the standards God wanted, and some of them didn't care what God thought. And just in case somebody didn't get the message, they didn't read 1 and 2, they come to chapter 3, and here what Paul does is really give the state of humanity or the state of, uh, of living of what it means to, to be a person who doesn't always follow God. And when we read this, notice what he says, starting in verse 10 uh, of Romans 3. He says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they pra have practiced deceit. The poison of the asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so we start reading through these verses. What is pictured is a, pa a painted, a picture is painted that looks like you know, nobody really is who they want to be all the time. There's none who always do the right things. There are times that we have spoke deceitfully. There are times that we have hurt people with our, with our words. There are times that we know God says to do this and we don't do it. There are those times in our lives that when we're not exactly who we need to be. But notice what happens. Or turn our Bible, i got to turn my next page, but look on down, starting where, where it goes to, to verse 23. Now, again, we're having um, God apart from the law is revealing a righteousness. Notice what he says in verse 23. For all have sinned and fought short of the glory of God. And when we look at this, the, the all have sinned is, is written in such a way it means at one point in time. At least one time in our life we have sinned. We, we're, we have not done what God wanted. We have at least sinned one time. The fall short is a, is a perfect tense, which means we fell short before, but we're still not there. We're still not as good as we're ever going to be. But there's hope. Notice what he says in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in G Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance, in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now some things I want us to, to look at, this idea of being justified. Being justified has the idea of not carrying a blame for something. 
Notice in verse 4, we, we're not carrying the blame because we've been justified freely by the grace that is found in the redemption of Jesus. And that's making peace. Which means it's not that we're so good God says, hey, they finally got it. No. It's about something Jesus did. We look on down in verse 25, God sent Jesus as a propitiation. You say, that's a big word, I don't use it. What does it mean? I don't use it unless I'm reading here and going to 1 John. The idea of propitiation is God's wrath was appeased. He was the appeasement. He's the one that set it in order. Now, when we look at this idea of God's wrath towards sin, when we look at it, a law had been broken. Something had happened. Because the law was broken, because sin had entered, because we committed that sin, we deserved something. And Jesus took the something in our place. Jesus took that on himself. So we didn't have to. So that's the idea of propitiation. And notice how far Paul goes. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now think about that idea. If sin deserves death, and it does. Why did people just not sin as soon and die as soon as they sin? Why, why not just, and that's it. That's all over. Why not? Because of the forbearance of God. God looked over those towards something bigger. He looked over those sins for something greater. What did he see? We saw Jesus taking that on himself, become that propitiation. Notice, why would he be right in doing it? Why? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See, what it meant was a death was to occur. Jesus said, I'll take that. I'll take that. And so how is he just in letting us go to heaven? Because Jesus said, I'll pay that. I'll pay that. So let's look at it something in just a, a physical sense, and then we can make some spiritual application. Say, say we you know, out here in a little bit, we, we leave and we're out, go to different places, and say that I ran into you at a store. Now, it doesn't matter which store. You can pick the store. Some of us go to Walgreens, Walmart. Um, you know, we might go out to eat. And I see you there, and I just pick your tab up and go pay it for you. It got paid. You don't owe it anymore. They can let you leave freely with all the goods because the debt was paid. When we look at Jesus spiritually, that's what happened. When Jesus died, he paid the debt that was due. Everything our sins put on us as far as a bill or a tab, Jesus picked all that up on the cross, every single bit of it. So why can we go to heaven? Because our debt has been paid. Our debt has been paid. Peace was made. We turn our Bibles back to John chapter 3. This is what Jesus is talking about to Nicodemus, although Nicodemus doesn't, doesn't, doesn't seem like he gets it when Jesus first tells him this. He starts out in, in verse 14. Sometimes we, we don't look at the verses before verse 16. We go straight to 16 and we kind of let that stand. But notice what it says. It says in verse 14, and, Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Well, what's this verse 14 about? See, when you read the book of Numbers, when you come to, to chapter 21, we see the people were complaining. Now, when we read the book of Numbers, that shouldn't surprise us. They complained and murmured over everything. At this time, God said, well, I'll send, fire, I'll send fiery serpents into the camp. The fiery serpents, when they bit people, they died. Moses interceded for the people. What did God tell Moses? Make a bronze serpent, set it up in the middle of the camp, that whoever looks at that serpent can be healed. See, that's the picture. That's what Jesus is painting. 
as the people who got bit by the fiery serpents and were doomed to die. If they looked to that serpent, they could live, but they got to look where? To the serpent. Even as that serpent was raised up, so also should the Son of Man be. See, that's making peace. We were deserved to die. Jesus came so we would live. See, he didn't come to condemn. He came to bring healing and peace. That's why he came. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, starting in verse 4. Notice how John lays it out. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The idea is sin acts as if law doesn't exist. It does its own thing. It's not caring what God says. It's going out and doing its own thing anyway. But notice what verse 5 says. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. And so when we look at this, again, we have this, sin looks like this. Jesus was sent, or made known, manifested means made known. He's, he was sent to take that stuff away. And, and so when we look at God, God is the ultimate peacemaker. And what I mean by that, he went the furthest anybody could go. Not only does the peace that he brings satisfy our life on this earth, but it satisfies life after this life is over. Now that's wonderful, isn't it? God acted on our behalf when we were acting in rebellion so that we could be reconciled or brought back to him. That's peace. That's peace. And so let's look at us for a few minutes. We're not, we're not the, the son of God, but what does it say for us? How, how do we do this? How do we, how do we become some of these peacemakers? We turn the Bibles to Romans chapter 12, and notice how Paul lays it out. There are several things here we can, we can glean uh, and get from these passages. Verse 18 is, is the hub, if you will, of making peace. Notice what he says, Romans 12 and 18, if it is possible. Now notice there's a big word there. It's two letters, but it's a big word. If. If it is possible. Now notice he clarifies it more. As much as depends on you. So whatever your part is in the situation, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. Now that's an amazing thought. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live at peace. If you're the one that has to make the decision what do you decide on? you got to decide on peace. Now notice, what does this mean? I said that was a hub. Let's look up. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for the good things inside of all men, as much as depends on you. Don't repay evil for evil. If someone has done you wrong, don't go out and try to do them more wrong, because you know what's going to happen. We already know how this works. Once you draw the line in the sand, they're going to cross it, right? So don't get more evil, you're only going to get more evil. Then you do more evil, and then you do more evil, and there's no peace if we're all acting evil. It don't work that way. So don't repay evil for evil, but do good things. Verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Says the Lord, do not avenge yourselves. Yeah, don't have to get even. We don't have to get even. Who's going to get even for us? Well, God's going to do that. If God's going to get even for us, why should I even worry about it? I shouldn't worry about it. You shouldn't worry about it. God's already got that taken care of. We have regard for good things, and as much as depends on us, we're trying to live peaceable. God will take care of it. He already knows how. Now think about that. If I'm not doing evil back, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to repay things, we should, we should be pretty good to get along with. That's peacemaking. You've got to practice true forgiveness in Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews chapter 8, what, what the Hebrews writer did is quote Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. 
And as he quotes this, he talks about a new covenant. It's unlike the old covenant that he did with the fathers. There's a new covenant that's coming out. We're part of that, that new covenant. Notice what he says in verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their deeds and lawless and their and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. So that's that verse 12 there. The idea is that God doesn't hold it against us anymore. He doesn't hold those things in account anymore. Now what would life be like if someone done us wrong and we never reminded them of how they did us wrong? Wouldn't that be so much simpler? But you know how it works. Sometimes if we're not careful, we let something happen five, ten years ago, come back up in a conversation, and we're fighting again about it. Just forget it. Don't bring it back into account. It's a new day. Remember, as much as depends on you, don't remember all the wrongdoings. You don't have to worry about it. God has all that taken care of. Just keep living. Just keep living. And, and you notice, again, as we start looking at all the Beatitudes, how it all built up to this one point. When we look at the attitude, the Beatitude we study, next week we're going to study, um, bless are you when you're persecuted. When, when you look at these ideas, none of these attitudes focus on who? They don't focus purely on me. They don't focus purely on me. Where are they pointing? They pointed up, up. And as we start looking at our relationship with God, guess who it affects? The people who are around us. See, when I care more about myself than anybody else, I'm going to become selfish. That's it's what it happens. But when I care about the souls and needs of others, it's so much easier to let things go. Great example. Great example is Abraham. You can read about this in Genesis chapter 13. See, Abraham traveled around with Lot after he left Ur, and he starts traveling around. He goes with Lot, and as he travels down to Egypt, and he ends up coming back, he amasses great wealth. And not only does he amass great wealth, but Lot, his, his nephew, also amasses great wealth. And in Genesis chapter 13, there's a problem. The shepherds can't keep the herd straight. And they're trying to take care of their master's herds. And so Abraham's herds are wanting to mingle in with lots. And lots are trying to mingle in with, with Abraham's. And the shepherds don't want that. They're trying to keep them all separated. After all, I mean, they're responsible to their master, right? And, and if their flocks don't look good, they can't say it's because we let someone else eat the good stuff. And so there was a dispute among them. And with this dispute, Abram said, let's settle this. Let's fix it. Now, as you look at this fix, and I, I really want you to think about what Abram said, especially him being the elder, the older one. Now, he says this, Please let, in verse 8, Genesis 13, Please let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we're brethren. Now, how would we say this? Well, why are we fighting amongst each other? We're all related anyway. And you might have heard it said this, blood's thicker than water. Have you ever heard of that? You know when that's being said, something's going down. We're all related. Why are we fussing? Why are we fighting? There's no need for that. Notice verse 9. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, and I'll go right. Or if you go right, I will go to the left. Now, could you imagine standing on a hillside looking at all these plains here? You can see all this fertile ground. Why are we fighting and we have all this place to be? We ain't going to be on top of one another. So you choose where you want to go, and I'll take where you don't want. Now think about that just for a second. You choose to go wherever you want to go, and I'll go the other direction. There's no need to fight. Let's just make some peace. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zerar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Now wait a minute. Wait. He looked up, and he saw something that looked like the garden of Eden, and he chose that. And Abram let him have it. 
It wasn't worth fighting over. He just let him have it. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelt in the plains of the, the cities of the plain and, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. And so he goes, so what does he have left? Abram really has wasteland, desert. It's not lush and green. Now as we go to chapter 14, there's something we find out here. We find out there's a war going on. And as there's a war going on, Lot gets taken captive, and his herdsmen, and they get carried off. Abram said, let's go get him back. Abram said, let's go get him back. And really let that sink in. Because we'd all probably agree if our nephew chose the best place to live and gave us the scraps, would we say, let's go save that boy. He's in trouble. But that's what Abram did. That is peacemaking. That is peacemaking. And then when Lot chose to go back to Sodom, have no idea why he would, Abram led him. But he gave him the choice to stay. See, that's peacemaking. See, when we start looking at God, God's the ultimate peacemaker. I mean, you sit down and think about it, who have you sinned most against? Well, the Almighty. Who is the most willing to forgive you? Well, the Almighty. See, the ultimate peacemaker. When we seek to make peace, we act like God. That's what God wants. He wants unity. He doesn't want disunity. He wants unity. He wants his people to be together. He wants them to have the same mind. When we start reading the scriptures, how often do we see that? That's what God wants. That's what God wants. He has made a way when there was no way for our salvation. How wonderful is that? As we live our lives, just think about it. We have an opportunity to make peace with people. There are times we don't always get along. Sometimes we say something we ought to. Sometimes they say something they ought to. But every time we have an opportunity to do what? To make peace. And what was the blessing? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now sometimes in our world we get the idea of son kind of mixed up. We think it's just purely a, a physical relation. But that's not all it is. To be a son means to act like. To act like. You see it in John chapter 8. You're of your father the devil. Why? He was the father of lies, lied from the beginning. Sons of God act like God. See, that's an amazing thought. It's an amazing thought. So today, let's not keep records of wrongs. Let's not stir up strife and trouble. Let's be the one who wants to make peace. That brings that still calm into the souls of those who are around. Today, what's your life like? Are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with your relationship with God? If not, why not? Why not? If you put Christ on some time ago in baptism and walked astray, repent, pray, and come back. We can pray with you and we pray for you. He wants you to go home. If you've not yet put Christ on baptism, but you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're willing to tell people he's the Christ, you're willing to repent, change your life in accordance with that fact, put him on in baptism, have those sins washed away. The debt has already been paid. And live a life following Jesus and go to your heavenly home. Or maybe you need prayers or the like, something outside of salvation. You let it be known as we sing this song of invitation.